Uh, great. First, me, uh, can you hear me at the back okay? Yeah, great. Uh, so uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk, and thank you all for attending. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kishan. I work as a data science manager at a luxury fashion e-commerce company called Farfetch, where I work on large-scale time series forecasting and pricing optimization. Uh, when I can, I uh, also contribute to open source and recently made some contributions to the time series decomposition modules and stats models. Uh, I'm also uh, developing an online course on the same topic, feature engineering for, for forecasting. Uh, if you're interested, please check it out. So what is this talk about? This talk is all about how do you convert a time series forecasting task uh, where you're going to predict the future value of some sequence or a set of sequences and convert that into a, a tabular machine learning regression task. And then that way we can use our, our classic models like random forest and linear regression. So my talk is split into two main key themes. One is just how do we do forecasting when we're working with tabular data? Uh, and secondly, how do we build good features once we're doing that? So firstly, I'm just going to motivate why we would want to use machine learning uh, for time series forecasting. Uh, and I want to motivate that by way of an example. Uh, so a couple of years back, there was one of these big forecasting competitions, so-called M competition. So this was the fifth one, the M5 competition. Uh, and the challenge here was to predict the future value of a set of retail products. And so the, the company was Walmart. And the reason why it was interesting was the, the nature of the data. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, there were over 30,000 product store combinations, product ID store combinations, uh, and so that meant there were over 30,000 uh, correlated time series. Uh, there was a hierarchical structure to that data, so a product ID belonged to a department, a category, uh, it could be allocated to a store and then a state, so on, so there's a, a hierarchical aspect to the data. Uh, each time series can be of varying length, so a product can come online at different points in time. Um, as you can see from the time series in the bottom right, uh, there is no obvious seasonality and trend. Uh, it's highly sparse and intermittent. Uh, exogenous variables would also be thought to be quite important here, like the price of a product, uh, promotional activity, uh, and you'd expect multiple seasonal patterns, like uh, Week, week effect, so the day, uh, weekends versus weekdays, the summer's gonna be different to the winter, uh, and so you get multiple seasonality. And so it turned out for a, a problem like this, uh, all of the top performing methods in the competition were actually quote unquote pure machine learning methods, um, and actually light GBM was used in a lot of the top solutions, and it was better than all of the standard statistical benchmarks traditionally used in time series forecasting, like ARIMA or an exponential smoothing. And so a machine learning approach is able to learn across a large number of related time series, also take into account exogenous variables, uh, and you can also get a neat little side effect if you're starting to use the, the, the standard regression models. You can, for example, get access to using sample weights, and you can use that in nifty ways, like giving more weight to recent data if you wanted to do that. Uh, you can also use custom loss, the custom loss functions, which was actually used in the uh, winning solution. And so these are some of the reasons why you might want to use a machine learning model for forecasting. Uh, that doesn't mean you should neglect simple statistical baselines, though, because 92.5% uh, of participating teams failed to beat one of the simplest statistical models, exponential smoothing, and even the top 50 entries only beat exponential smoothing by between 15 to 20%, uh, depending on the level of granularity you're looking at. Uh, and so you really have to make sure that the uplift that you're getting from using a machine learning approach warrants the additional complexity. So how do we do forecasting with machine learning? So let's say we start off with our time series, uh, and we want to predict uh, t plus 1, given that we're currently sat at time t. So we want to create a, a table of features uh, and a target variable. And so uh, as the target variable, you want to predict the sales, so you just directly use that as a target variable. Uh, and to start off with, the features that we want to create are from the past values of the target variable, because you want to use the values in the past to predict the future. Uh, what you must do, though, is only use data that you actually know at the time of the target. Otherwise, you can leak data from the future into the past. And I'll show you several examples of how this can quite easily occur. 
So we want to create some features from past values, and the simplest things that you can do is just directly use the, uh, the previous value. So if you're sad at t and you want to predict t plus 1, then use the value at t, t minus 1, and so on. These are kind of called lag features. And, if you know, and so now you've created a feature vector for, for the next step. And you, you do this for, for each value of the target. So now if you want to predict the uh, target variable at time t, you'll use the uh, value at t minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And so that way you create uh, a set of feature vectors associated with the target variable. Obviously, as you get towards the end of the time series, you'll get some missing data because there is a, a finite start. So this means you'll have features where you derive, uh, you derive the features from past values of the time series itself. I've shown you some very simple ones here, so-called lag features. I'll show you some slightly more complicated ones later. Then you also have features where you might know the values in the past and in the future. For example, marketing spend might be one. You might know on a given day how much marketing spend there was, uh, and, how, and you observe the sales. And you might also have a budget where you know the value of the marketing spend in the future. So it's quite easy to include that in your feature vector. You just use it directly. Then you might also have features where you only observe the values in the past, but you don't know them in the future. And that typically happens with things like, for example, the weather. Uh, perhaps rainfall affects the sales of your product, and you only know that in the past. So what you have to do is find a way of uh, predicting it in the future to put in your feature vector. So one thing you can do is use an alternative forecast. So if you have a weather forecast, you can plug that in directly. Uh, or you have to create your own naive forecast where you might just predict out the, the previous value. And if neither of those are suitable for your use case, you can also use lagged versions of, uh, of say, a weather-related feature. So if you want to predict the sales uh, tomorrow, you use the rainfall today. And just like we did for the target variable, you lag them. Uh, lastly, one which you may not hear as much about is actually so-called static features. They're called static because they don't change uh, for a given time series, and typically they refer to some metadata about your time series. So when you're dealing with multiple time series, let's say you have sales in multiple countries, uh, then you will actually have the static feature different between time series, but within a time series, it's the same. Uh, and so you can use that information to try and train a model to learn the differences between different groups of time series, for example. And so with that, we kind of have a table of data. So we've got our features, we have a target, uh, and then you can use uh, everything in blue there as training data. We'll show later how we encode the categorical features and missing data. Uh, so you can now fit your model, SK learn style, use whatever you want, and you can predict one step into the future. In practice, you'll want to do multi-step forecasting. You, you care about forecasting more than just one step into the future. So how do you do that? So there are two main techniques to do this. One is called direct forecasting, and the other is called recursive forecasting. So in direct forecasting, you're going to directly predict the value of the target at time t plus 1, t plus 2, and so on with the information you have at time t. So effectively, you're using the same features, but you're creating different target variables for each forecast step. So you end up training multiple models uh, with different targets. So let me just show you how that might look in practice. So as you're creating the feature vectors, you start off at some time, and we might use our lag features again. So we, 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 create the, we populate a feature vector, and if we want to forecast one step ahead, uh, we'll create a target for that, another target for the second step ahead, and so on. And so now you have a single feature vector and multiple targets. And then you can construct your feature vector for the next step ahead, and so on. So you end up training uh, a model on effectively the same set of features, uh, but you'll give them different target variables. And so when you plug in the feature vector from the most recent time period, each model will give you a different step ahead forecast. Now this has the obvious disadvantage that you have to train multiple models. So if you want to do a 28 day ahead forecast, you have 28 models. Uh, have fun putting that into production. Um, so is there a simpler approach here? Uh, yes, so with recursive forecasting, uh, you only train a model once. Uh, you train a one step ahead forecast model and you use it repeatedly. So let me just show you how that works. So you sat at time t, you create your features, uh, you train a model to predict one step ahead like I showed before, 
and then you make a forecast, but you plug that forecast back into your target time series, and then you recreate the feature vector for the next step ahead and plug that back into the model. And so you're doing a series of one step ahead forecasts. I'm going to show you what that looks like on a tabular data set. So imagine you've already dealt with your static features, your future known features, and your future unknown features, and you've already created your feature vector for the future. Uh, now you just have to be concerned about the features that you derive from the target variable. So let's just focus on that. Um, so for the doing the first step ahead, it's quite simple. We can create our lag features just by looking at the historical data there. So that one's fine. You can train a model dot predict, you've got a one step ahead forecast. Now you plug that back in and you create the new feature vector using uh, the information from the forecast as well. So now the forecast is inputted into the feature vector and it's plugged back into itself. And that way you can forecast as many steps ahead as you want. Now this comes also with its own set of drawbacks because if you have any error or the model's not very accurate, then you propagate that error as you're doing multi-step forecasting. You're also only directly optimizing on forecasting one step ahead. Your actual problem is to forecast multiple steps ahead. So you're not actually optimizing on what you care about, but it is computationally simpler to do. Uh, there's also some code complexity having to go through this procedure, uh, which is why later I'll show you some good libraries to help you do this. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about on this topic is also how do we validate a time series model or, or a forecasting model. So typically when we're dealing with tabular data, you just do randomly split the data between a test set and a training set. Uh, you can't actually do that in this case because the assumption that allowed you to do that traditionally for classification and regression tasks is that the rows are independent. Here there's a time ordering to your data and so the rows are not independent. You can't just shuffle them into a train and test set. This is because you might plug uh, values in the test set which are from the past. You might have values in the training set from the future. And so you're using the future values to predict the past and you'll have a very bad estimate of how good your forecasting model is. Instead, you need to split by time uh, and replicate the actual forecasting process itself. So let me just visualize that for you. So typically you'll order your data by time, so you have the full data set, and then you split at some period, so you, you, you pretend that you're sat at that time point and you're having to create your features at that point and then predict over some value uh, forward. I'm not sure if the colors are coming across too well there. Um, and then you move your time window forward and then you have another uh, fold where you can train and test on, but in a way that preserves the time ordering so you get a, an accurate estimation of the performance of your forecasting model. So one of the things I really want to highlight here is the difference between uh, doing a classification and regression task versus a forecasting task, despite the fact we're still dealing with tabular data, because the workflows are very different. Um, for a start, as I showed earlier, you, if you're doing a train test split, you traditionally could do that just by randomly shuffling. Now you have to care about preserving the time ordering. Um, when you uh, create the feature and target variable for regression and classification tasks, you could typically create the entire feature and target matrix before you even uh, go anywhere near the model, uh, before you plug them into dot fit and dot predict. Now, if you're doing recursive forecasting, uh, you're dynamically building some values that go into the test set at predict time. Uh, and so that's a, a big difference and it has a consequence for the next step that what do you do at predict time. Um, so for regression and classification tasks, you typically just need the trained model and then you have some input and you get a prediction. Not so for recursive forecasting because you need not just a trained model, but you also need to pass it the training set so it can rebuild those features that it derives from the target variable at predict time. So the way you serve the model is gonna be quite different uh, to just uh, classification uh, and regression. Lastly, uh, the feature engineering is quite different. There, there are a set of specific feature engineering methods for time series and a bunch of data leakage issues that you didn't have to consider as much uh, when thinking about regression and classification tasks. So um, with that, I, I'll move on to the next section and also make the suggestion that rather than coding a lot of this from scratch, I highly recommend using some time series libraries and I'll come on to those later. So let's talk about uh, how we build good features for time series forecasting. So the area covers quite uh, a wide range of, uh, of areas uh, for time series. So uh, feature engineering covers everything from 
how do you handle missing data and outliers, which have their own specific techniques when you're dealing with time series? Um, how do you transform your time series to potentially make it easier to forecast, like taking a log transform, or do you detrend or deseasonalize the data first? How do you handle categorical features now? Um, you can extract a lot of information just from the temporal part of the problem, things like uh, taking stuff from the calendar, like the, 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 the month, uh, the week of the year, et cetera, holidays. Um, you can also derive uh, features from the past values of the target uh, and, and other features. Uh, and also, time series often contain trend and seasonality, which is quite important, and you might be interested in capturing things like change points, uh, step changes, uh, and, and seasonality. And so you can create nifty features to, to try and capture that. Given the, the time constraints, I'm only going to talk about some of, uh, some of these, uh, which are commonly used and were actually used also in the, uh, the, the winning solution for the M5 forecasting competition. Uh, so just as a principle that you should always take away when working with time series is when you're creating features, only use data that you actually will know at the time of prediction. Uh, it uh, sounds a lot easier to do, uh, but then I'll show you that it, it can happen in all sorts of ways where you accidentally leak information from the future into the past. So let's talk about a specific example. Let's say you're trying to predict uh, the sales of multiple different products. So you have a, a table of data. You've got the product ID, some advertising spend, and the sales. Uh, and you've concatenated the data, so you've got, uh, I've tried to highlight the, the, the different time series with different colors here, but you've basically got different time series concatenated in a, in a single table. And you want to predict uh, the next step ahead. So how do you first of all set up the target variable? Now you're dealing with multiple time series. Uh, if your table looks like this, you can just directly use uh, the sales column as, as your target vector. The interesting thing to note here is that uh, you're now mixing multiple different time series in, in the target vector. The model doesn't know uh, that any given row is coming from the same time series or even from different time series altogether. Um, so that, that's one thing just to, to bear in mind there. And so the first kind of simple class of features you can create are just what are called lag features. And this is where you're using uh, the previous values of the target and feature features themselves. The logic here being that the past values are the, most, are the ones most likely to be predictive of the future, so just using yesterday's value and the day before. But also, um, seasonal lags are very common, and this is just a very quick and dirty way to capture some seasonality. If you know your data has weekly seasonality, then include a, a lag of one week, and I'll show you that works quite well in an example later. You might also use uh, the lags of other target time series. So you might use the, uh, the previous values of one product to predict the future values of a different product. You have to be very careful if you were to do this because you create another feature vector for each product. So if you've got a large category of products, catalog of products, uh, you probably don't want to do this. But if you've got a small number of time series in a, and you want to model the dependence between them, this is an easy way of doing it. Uh, lastly, the past values of exogenous features can also be quite predictive, in particular to capture effects which are distributed over time. Let me just give you an example. Uh, let's say you have some degree of marketing spend today. That could impact the sales today, but it could also have an impact on the sales tomorrow and the day after and so on. The effect is distributed over time. Uh, and so you can also just use a series of lags for, say, advertising spend to try and capture uh, that effect. And sometimes that's known as, as distributed lags. So what does this look like when you're actually building your table of features? Uh, as I've shown before, you're just using the past values to construct the feature vectors in a way that you don't leak information. And you just slide your, your way across. Uh, when you do this in practice, effectively just shifting the column by the amount of the lag. You have to be very careful that if you're dealing with a, a data frame that looks like this, if you do a shift, you don't want to accidentally move information from one time series to the other at the edges. So do a group by and then shift. Uh, so window features are kind of an extension of, of lag features. So rather than just directly using the past values, you're going to compute uh, a summary statistic or function over uh, several past values. So you might take the mean or standard deviation of the last five values. 
that can be quite helpful to smooth out any volatility you might have. But also, if you're using the standard deviation, you can measure the volatility and use that as a, uh, as a predictive feature. So once again, what does that look like on our, on our table to, to build for features in our target? Um, you have to define some window size. Uh, and then you basically drag your, your window across and compute your, your features. One thing to note here is that after we compute our statistics, we are lagging the value by one to preserve the, the time ordering here and to make sure that we don't accidentally use values at the same time to predict uh, the target at the same time, hence the lag. If we were to just do pd.rolling.mean, uh, the rolling average would be computed. So where, where we've got 34, it would be along the same row. And so you'd be leaking information at that time into your features, which you don't want to do. Does that make sense? OK, perfect. Um, uh, so a very common tactic here is to nest uh, several different window sizes. Um, so the, the objective here is basically to capture any differences in different time scales. Uh, and so you just compute the, the averages or, or, st or whatever statistics you're interested in over various different time scales uh, for both the target and, and features. I've seen both done. Uh, and then you will end up with uh, several features, one for each, each window size. Now, uh, the last one I want to show are so-called static features. And so these are the ones which don't vary uh, within a time series, but can vary between time series. Uh, and so this typically refers to metadata. So here I'm showing product ID. Um, but you might also have, say, product category. Uh, so a given product ID might be of type shorts. Uh, another one might be watches. So your data set might actually be a bunch of time series. And you might have some shorts and some watches. Uh, shorts might be highly seasonable, uh, and watches are not. It would be good to be able to feed that information to the model so that it knows that uh, there are differences between groups of time series. And as I mentioned earlier, just by looking at the target vector, especially if you're treating it as a tabular regression problem, the model doesn't know that there's any relationship between any data point. You have to put it in the feature. So a very simple uh, way of doing that is actually target encoding, which is heavily used in classification and regression tasks. And so what you do there is you will just group by your categorical variable uh, and then just take the mean on the training data. And so here we're just taking the mean of, say, SKU1 over, over its historical time series. And you do that the same for SKU2. And then if the uh, mean for SKU1 is 30, then you just impute 30 for wherever you saw SKU1 and, and so forth for SKU2. Before I move on, does anyone see any issue with this at all? So uh, yeah, one comment on the how do you deal with new data. Pardon? If the two are the same. If the two, uh, if the, ah, yes. So if, if the two values are the same, then the model effectively thinks the two product IDs are the same, because you're, you're representing the, the product by its sales, basically. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, there's an, ah. Uh, the mean is not detecting good for seasonality. That's correct. But here, you're just trying to create a numeric value for your, for your feature. So it's not necessarily a, a, an issue. Perfect. Yes, exactly. Uh, so there's no leakage between the training set and the test set. That's fine, because you only use the training data to compute your encoding. So if you were to test your model, the error metric you get is going to be reliable. But you are getting target leakage, because within the training set, you're using information from the future uh, in, in, in previous values. And I'll show a visualization of that. Uh, and so this can create some overfitting to this particular feature. So let me just show you that. So let's say you've got your time series here. Uh, you have some values in the past, and uh, then you, you split your data, so train and test. Uh, and you've got your product ID there. You now just take the mean across your training set, and you're imputing your, your product ID there, right? So now think about what the model will do if it's when it's training on, say, the second time point. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the model doesn't know about any of the future values, but because you've encoded it using the mean over the whole training set, it can, for example, infer that, well, I know the time series is going to increase because it already has that information from the future. 
Uh, and so the model is going to say, well, this is a very predictive feature, uh, when in practice it, it may not be as predictive as you think it is. Uh, so a small adjustment you can do is, as I said at the beginning, only use the information you actually have available to you at that point in time. And so you would only use the data prior to that point to compute the encoding then. And then you basically have an expanding window. And so the encoding will actually change over time. Uh, and, and that way, you're not leaking any information from the future into the past. Uh, so now there's probably another question on like, how do you go into the future? When, like, how do you compute the encoding for future values? Uh, for one step ahead forecasting, that, that's OK. You're just going to take the mean over the whole training set prior to that, so you can create that feature vector. Uh, if you're doing recursive forecasting, uh, then you have to go, to go through that whole shtick again. So um, you, you train the model. You uh, make a prediction one step ahead, and then you have to recompute the encoding so that you're consistently creating the feature in the same way as you're doing in the training set as you are in the test set. Uh, if you were going to use uh, direct forecasting, you could try just projecting it out, um, or you have to preserve the, uh, the time distance between the value that you're predicting in the future and then the window in the past that you're going to take the, uh, the mean over the training set over. So just some key takeaways I, I want to give you from, from this uh, section is that data leakage is a huge risk, and it can quite easily happen, especially when you're creating features uh, from the target or, or future unknown variables. Hence, you should only try and use information that you actually know at the time of the target. And also, the handling of features can vary at predict time, depending on how you're going to do multi-step forecasting. And so the code that you're going to have to write and how you handle features can be completely different depending on what you do. And so there are some useful libraries out there that can help us do that. Uh, and uh, so I just want to give you an overview of some of those and, and give you an example. Uh, so if you're just interested in taking a data frame and creating a bunch of time series features, uh, you could use something like TS Fresh, your feature engine. A feature engine. Uh, TS Fresh basically computes a very large number of different time series statistics. Uh, so you have time series goes in, statistic come out, and they have quite a lot there. If you're actually interested in doing uh, forecasting uh, using uh, tabular data with whatever your favorite machine learning model is, whether that's like GBM or, or a random forest, um, then both Darts and SK Time are fantastic libraries that enable you to do this. The scope of those projects is way larger. SK Time, for example, also offers lots of cool feature engineering techniques and transformers if you want to create a nice, neat pipeline. Um, but they also enable you to do recursive uh, or direct forecasting and provide wrappers around that so you don't have to implement the um, recreation of, say, lag features as you're moving forward in time. Uh, also makes time series cross-validation very easy as well. Uh, so I'm just going to show you an example uh, using darts, because that's one I was slightly more familiar with before making this talk, after talking to some of the S -time, SK Time contributors on, on Friday. I highly recommend also looking at, at SK Time. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about doing forecasting with tabular data? Let, let's show you an example. So imagine you have uh, a time series here. This is just uh, a monthly time series with values. It's actually the Air Passengers data set. Um, and the one thing you'll need is a wrapper around a data frame, so you import what's called a time series. Darts internally uses these time series objects, just a lightweight wrapper around a pandas data frame. And then it's the regression model that you import that does all the heavy lifting and implements um, all the complexities around recursive forecasting for you. And then you can import any uh, regression model that you're interested in from sklearn. So here I'm just going to use linear regression, but it can be whatever you want. Uh, and then the first thing you'll do is wrap your, uh, your data frame into a time series object. Uh, you can create a, uh, a holdout set, so the last 24 points uh, are, are held out, and you use the f everything uh, before that uh, as training. And then it's in the regression model itself where you're going to define the lag features that you want. You don't have to create them beforehand in a data frame and then pass that. Um, and, and the reason for that is because you need to tell the model the logic of uh, how do you recreate those features. And so they're passed to the, the regression model class. So here we're going to use a lag of 1, 2, and 12. Uh, and then you specify which, which regression model you want to use. And in this case, it's just linear regression. Uh, and then you've got your model uh, object. You can just hit dot fit on your, on your time series, uh, and then dot predict, and you specify how many points into the future you want to extrapolate to. So here it's just 24. Uh, and uh, I did mention that just using a lag of 12 can help capture the seasonality. 
you'll see that quite nicely here. Uh, and so uh, that works quite well. So just using a lag of 12, for example. Uh, and so there I've shown you how to do recursive forecasting using linear regression on a single time series and only lag features. What if you have covariates? So here we might have additional things like your future known features. So you might know your marketing spend in the past and the future. Um, you can also extract information from the calendar, which would be quite helpful, things like the, the month and the year. Uh, the month in particular can help you capture some additional seasonality which might be specific for given months. Maybe Black Friday occurs in a given month, quite useful to have. Um, so what do you do there? Well, uh, you just pass that, th those features as a pandas data frame uh, and convert it into a time series. So in darts, they call these future covariates. So uh, on the bottom there, you've got future cov equals time series from data frame df, and I've just sub uh, selected those features. So now you've got uh, uh, a time series object for your time series and your covariates. Uh, and then you make one slight tweak in the regression model. Darts allows you to also specify if you want to have lag features of your uh, covariates. So if I wanted to do the lag of marketing spend, you can specify that directly uh, in that argument there. In this case, I've just said don't lag it, uh, lag of zero. Uh, and then you just pass your covariates at model.fit. And then at model.predict, you just say uh, how many time points in the future. Note that we're also passing the training set uh, as well, as, as I mentioned earlier, which is a key difference between classification and, and regression tasks. Uh, and then that's it. You can do dot .predict. And now you've uh, included features as well. Now let's show you one last example, which is slightly more complicated. Uh, so it's quite typical. You run a query. You pull your data. You have a timestamp. You might have uh, some metadata about your product. So you have country, the product ID, uh, and then you have your, your target variable, in this case, sales. And you have some features. Uh, how do you handle all of this? Uh, so Darts has a, a nice helper function called from group data frame. I'm not sure how clear that is from here. Uh, but it allows you to specify the group columns, uh, which define your individual time series. So in this case, it would be country and product ID. Uh, you specify your time column uh, and the, uh, the value of the time series, which for the target time series will just be Y. You do a similar thing for your future covariates. And, and what that does is it creates a, a list of time series. So it'll transform your data from this view to a list of uh, lots of individual time series, which also just want to note here that the time indexes for these time series can also be different. They don't need to all be uh, indexed at the same time. Uh, and in the future covariates, you'll also have your features, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between your, your, your Ys and your Xs. And then uh, same, same kind of shtick. You put in model.fit, you put all of your training data there and your future covariates, and you're passing a multiple time series now. Under the hood, the regression model is building your features, stacking them together, creating a tabular view that you can then do model.fit and dot .predict, recursively build uh, the features uh, for each of your individual time series. So you're getting a lot of value here um, from, from using the, the library to do that for you. Uh, and then at predict time, you can say, well, I'm only interested in uh, making a forecast for just these two individual time series. So I can specify that I just wanted those particular two there at the bottom during dot predict. And then you will just have uh, a forecast for those two time series. Um, and yeah, just a reminder, so the model is training simultaneously here on all of your time series at the same time. The time indexes may not even be aligned. Good luck doing that with ARIMA. Um, and so I've shown you here that uh, how you can do recursive forecasting with linear regression on many time series with lag features and future known features. Uh, I haven't shown window features because you can't, as far as I'm aware, do that in darts yet, but you can do it in SK time. Um, so just to conclude, uh, forecasting can be treated as a tabular machine learning kind of regression task, and it can be competitive with uh, more traditional statistical models. Uh, the feature engineering and machine learning workflow is quite different for time series forecasting, uh, and forecasting has its own set of feature engineering methods and concerns around leaking data from the future, uh, and there's more and more becoming available in the Python ecosystem, so do uh, watch out for those libraries. If you'd like to learn more, uh, I'm creating a course with Solid Gali. There's also going to be a GitHub repo with a bunch of free materials uh, associated with that. Uh, some references I used whilst uh, building the course, uh, building the, uh, the talk. Uh, the talk's already been shared in the Slack channel, uh, FYI. Uh, and that's it. Do you have any questions?
Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I would like to ask about the, if you can talk a bit about the feature selection uh, process. So for example, you mentioned these, you know, that you can create like multiple lags and like multiple windows. So for example, if I create like lag one, lag two, lag three, then lag, uh, you know, window one, window two, window three. So all of those effectively sort of share the same information and become like correlated. What are the sort of typical processes for, you know, for selecting those features and like yeah, dealing with that? Okay, so there are multiple things you can do here. Um, so if, I, if you go back to say the, the, the realm of regression and classification, sometimes you don't care so much about doing feature selection uh, because uh, regularization helps you out an awful lot, right? So the reason you do feature selection is just because you wanna reduce the amount of feature engineering and simplify your pipelines, typically. Um, if you don't care about that, then just use a model with some regularization. Uh, in other cases, uh, you can use, uh, so let's say lag features, right? Uh, you can use kind of more principal approaches where you can look at, say, the autocorrelation function, try and help you understand which lags are the most important uh, lags to use. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know, the autocorrelation function tells you um, how much the time series is correlated with itself at different lagged values of itself. So um, yeah, that, that's basically it, it's in a nutshell. So you can use other methods like that. You might have domain knowledge as well. Certain lags might be more important than others. Um, other things I've seen done is you just use lasso on a one step ahead forecast and then hope for the best that that will extend for your multi-step forecasting. Uh, always, but at the end of the day, you should always benchmark using time series cross validation to see the performance after you do all of that feature selection. The other thing I'd say as well here is that you want to distinguish um, doing time, like I, do you actually care about forecasting and you just care about the future? Or do you care about understanding the relationship of your feature and the future? Because so, uh, so I also do work on, on pricing optimization, and you'll just shove price into this, right? But if you've got a, lot, a bunch of correlated features, you can't just say, okay, I'm gonna take my model, change the price, and that's gonna be the change in demand. Um, and so it also really depends on what you want to do there, because that's more about causality. But a lot of people will take a time series forecasting approach uh, to understand the relationship between one feature and, 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 and say, demand, for example. Um, in the beginning, when you're talking about splitting your training and test data, right? Um, you alluded about the M5 that some people used some kind of uh, time weighted or some weights or cross time to basically discount really old data and just concentrate on more present data. Do you have any kind of heuristic on what kind of function to use for that? Ah, okay, so, uh, so as far as I know, I, I didn't see that actually used in the M5 forecasting competition. It was just an idea that I had myself that uh, th having access to sample feature, uh, to, to the sample weights uh, allows you to do that if you want to do so. For example, let's say uh, a global pandemic occurs and you want to, and that changes your sales distribution, uh, you might want to give more weight during a, uh, to your model during a specific time horizon and the sample weights will allow you to do that. Right, but how, how do you smooth, do you smooth it out or do you say anything before, you know, uh, March 2020, I'm gonna ignore, or do you wanna kind of have like a nice transition? Um, no, honestly, I don't know. The way I would approach that is potentially looking at having some kind of, exp like a set of weights that decays mm. exponentially as you get back in time, make sure the weights sum to one uh, would be one way of doing it. And then okay. you can probably have a parameter about how quickly that exponential function decays. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, would you recommend window lags uh, and direct lags to use in one time series experiment? As in, would you use them both at the same yeah, time? Yeah, both features at the same time. Um, I'd say you have to try and see. So uh, in the M5 forecasting competition, when I looked at some of the solutions using like GBM, both were used. Um, uh, but in practice, you just got to see what, 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 what works. But, uh, yeah. And so regarding this windows la windowed lag, um, in your experience, are there enough to handle any seasonality effects, even long term? Because like I get that uh, uh, like a seven day windows could capture weekly seasonality, but if you also know you have some yearly seasonality, you probably won't have a, a 200, a 365 day window. Uh, so. Uh, in that case, should the season ID be removed before applying the model, or what would you do? Uh, it depends what you're trying to achieve there, because um, I mean, 
I would avoid using very large window size as well because you end up cutting a lot of the data at the beginning uh, of the time series if you were to do that. I mean, you should really be capturing seasonality uh, using other features uh, rather than trying to capture them by changing your moving average, the size of your window. Thank you. Yeah. Just to expand on that as well, I mean, there are a few ways you can also deal with seasonality. You might actually, so there are a set of methods called time series decomposition methods like STL, which will allow you to de so de-seasonalize the data first and then you, you know, there's a couple of interesting points there. So you could de-seasonalize the data and then you're just modeling trend and noise, right? And then you add the seasonal component back in. Uh, that can be quite good if you want to use tree-based models because if you do have significant trend in your data, remember, trees cannot extrapolate, right? Like it's a step function. Uh, and so typically you might uh, think about de-seasonalizing and detrending, training model, predicting and bringing that in afterwards or using a separate forecast for the seasonality and the trend. And so there's a whole like Swiss army knife of methods that you could use for, for this kind of stuff. Um, if you were going to, you were talking about your forecasting for the independent variables. Have you ever considered doing the instrument-free inference for that? So I didn't quite catch the, the instrument-free inference. So you know how you you could use like an instrument variable, but instead you estimate the instrument variable. So have I'm you not ever familiar. tried that? What, what do you mean by an instrument variable? Sorry. Um, so when you don't have the knowledge of one of the independent variables, and then you could you know do like a two-stage least squares regression, and if you can't do that for whatever reason, then you can set parameters um, on a confidence interval and then take the average of that. Or I'm, I not, can explain I'm not, not going to pretend like I've understood the okay. question. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, uh, maybe I'll we can catch up afterwards. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah. How do you deal with seasonality that wanders around the calendar a bit, like um, Easter? Uh, so that you typically just do like a, you can, there are many things you can do. One is you just have like a, a one hot feature, so you know, is Easter uh, is an easy one, uh, or if you have like something where you, you might have a set of your holidays and you just say is holiday zero one is a very easy way of dealing with those kind of things. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kishan. Uh, that's all we had time for, but I'm sure Kishan will be around for more questions. Thank you.